It is the Red Bulls Insider Podcast on MSG Networks. I am Christian Dyer, your insider, who's a little bit of an outsider from time to time. But boy, do we have a really great show lined up here today. We're going to be delving into the brand new trialist in Red Bulls camp. I know there's been a lot of talk about this guy all over social media and people just buzzing about the possibilities. Is he a fit? Is he not a fit? Where does he potentially line up on this Red Bulls team? Also going to sit down at the Red Bulls training facility in Hanover, New Jersey with John Wallenek, a longtime player with this club now charged as head coach of the USL team. Going to go into some topics with Wallenek for everything from player development to some trips down memory lane and the fact that he was robbed, robbed I say, in 2003 of the MLS goal of the year. What a tremendous strike that was. Going to try to break that down with Wallenek that moment. One of the really big moments in the first eight to ten years of the franchise's history was that strike. It was a last minute gasp and Fans of this team, uh, going back to the Metro Stars days, certainly remember John Wallenek. He had several tenures with this club, both as a Metro Star, as a Red Bull, a former first-round pick, and now perhaps making his biggest contribution um, with the organization, the fact that he that he is in charge of the development of so many young players, and uh, a Tyler Adams and a Sean Davis and, and other ones who are coming up now through the ranks, in large part due to the coaching job of John Wallenek. So that's going to be a lot of fun. But first things first, and we have Alexi Bassetti, who is here on trial, player that maybe a lot of fans of this club are not familiar with. He's a a League One player in France, over 70 appearances with the first team. Uh, Also played some time down a division in the second division in France as well on loan. He had a recent stint in Norway, and here's a little bit of the confusion and and I think why there's some hand-wringing about the guy. He played less than 40 minutes, had a couple appearances, and then was sent back on loan. And In an interview with, with the French media, outlet he said that he just had a hard time getting settled no one spoke the language or the French language uh, everything was in Norwegian uh, Bassetti who also speaks some English just wasn't able to communicate didn't understand tactics and truthfully a very rough rugged and incredibly direct Norwegian league perhaps not the best fit for a player of his skill set now I've been able to see him now through three days. And uh, what strikes out is technically he's a very good player. He brings a fair amount of pace. Certainly the fitness needs to get there. He's coming into his side in midseason. And he's only played really with the reserves with with, uh, his Nice club in in France. Uh, So he may not necessarily have the fitness level to come on in. He switches the field well. Uh, He tries to move forward with his passing. He passes into space. Good runs off the ball. And he's going up against a Red Bull starting 11 very often in training. So he's being able to be tested. He's being put under a lot of pressure. And so it's been a sample size of three days. But I think you can see some of the pieces there that make him an intriguing pick. Uh, I've gone and I've watched some video on this guy because admittedly, I didn't know a whole lot about him. I knew he was a part of the recent uh, French uh, you know, under 20 team that did so well at the, under, the last under 20, or rather two under 20 World Cups ago. He's a, he's a good technical player, uh, but he also shoots from distance. He's, he's, he's got a little bit of range to his game. He's got vision. He's got some pace. And to me, he can be one of those kind of end-to-end type of players who can stretch the midfield. And when we talk about the pressure that's being put on Sasha Kleshton this year, and to a certain extent, Bradley Wright Phillips up top, those two central players among the finalists for league MVP last year, uh, when, you know, you're, you've got your two best players really being marked out of games because there's no width to the attack. A player like a Bassetti could come right in and really do, I, I think, a good job of being able to relieve the pressure, but also to be able to get in behind other teams. Uh, and when you look at the way that Daniel Royer has played it, and I touched on this on one of my videos for MSG Networks uh, online uh, from, from this Train, you know, from this week in training, that Royer to me is a left sided player. He's good on his right foot, but more confident with his left, high work rate. I really want to see him on that left side at some point. 
and working along there with uh, Kamar Lawrence, overlapping a kind of really the integral motions that they're going to be able to have on and off the ball to widen things up, I think could really be an asset. And, and Royer's a very intelligent player. I think Lawrence is growing in confidence moving forward. It's a crime that this guy is not up for the MLS All-Star game. I don't know how that happened. Uh, but I think maybe Bassetti on the right side with an emerging Amir Murillo at right back could provide a similar sort of balance to the club on the right side as well, overlapping some pace uh, and perhaps just a little bit of better movement forward than right now what we're seeing from the Red Bull. So the trial's up on Friday. We should know more moving into next week about this about this player development and these things take time. He's not able to make a move until the summer transfer window opens up in July. So the, the Red Bulls do have some time to make a decision to get this thing ironed out. But through a handful of days in training, I think he's looked good. We also learned a little bit about this Red Bulls team this past weekend, a 2-1 win over the New England Revolution. Boy, did New York need these three points. They gutted it out. They went down early. It was a penalty kick call on Damian Perrinell. I think the right call was made back there. Um, it, it certainly was a PK to me. Uh, it, it wasn't a dirty challenge, but it was overtly physical and over the top. So I think you have to give this club a lot of credit. Down a goal, they didn't hang their heads. They didn't say, oh no, this is happening again. Instead, they sort of manned up really got behind each other. Being able to get that goal shortly after halftime was a huge lift to the club overall. They dominated possession, shots, corner kicks, a number of key statistics, but this looked far more like a Red Bulls team uh, that we've seen from the past two years. So I think there were some positives against a New England team that kept their shape. Uh, they're an athletic group. They're, they're a group that I think has the potential, depending on what they do in the summer transfer window, to be challenging for the playoffs this year. Uh, they have some very good pieces. And I think a 2-1 result, overcoming the early deficit like they did, was a positive for the Red Bulls. There you have it, some transfer talk talking about the last game. And coming up next on the Red Bulls Insider Show, John Wallenek, a man who played with this team a number of years, a former U.S. international. We kind of forget that about him. And a man, and I'm not going to let it go, a man who should have won the MLS Goal of the Year in 2003, USL head coach, New York Red Bulls 2, John Wallenek, coming up on the Red Bulls Insider Podcast. Well, John, thanks for taking a few minutes out, out of your schedule. You, you just got out of the video training with the first team session. Um, I, I don't think many fans know or understand that you have a role that's kind of a, a pivot between the USL squad and the first team squad, and you're really involved in both on a day-by-day -day basis. Yeah, I try to be around as much as possible, whether it be on the field or off the field in videos and um, training sessions, just because... For one, uh, I have some first team players with me on a regular basis in games, but but I don't always see them at my trainings, so I got to make sure I know how they're doing and how they're progressing, and um, you know uh, the process of development doesn't just start and end with with games; it continues through the week. So I got to make sure I'm around, and then secondly, I got to make sure that I know what's going on with the tactics and how Jesse's going about his business, so that I can continually um, implement things and and see if there's a change coming or. Um, you know, just making sure I'm on top of all the stuff that's going on at, at the, the first team so that I, I can uh, align uh, my games and my trainings uh, in that way so that guys are, you know, more and more prepared to, to participate with the first team. So as, as head coach of the USL team, you have to mirror in some ways what the first team does. Uh, does that mean if the team's going out with a 4-2-3-1, you try to mirror that, or 4-3-3, or, or when they were doing the 4-2-2-2 earlier this year, how much of that is getting just getting the guys on the field versus trying to emulate the style that's being played, and especially difficult when maybe there's a switch in style or formation for the, team, for the first team? Yeah, it's always a little tricky. Uh, you know, in develop, if from a development perspective, I, I don't feel like it's uh, fruitful to change formations from game to game. But at the same time, uh, I am preparing first team players uh, that could possibly uh, join the first team in a week, in a month, uh, next game, maybe six games down the line. Uh, so I definitely want to follow what the first team does, but I'm not going to, it's not dictated to me how to, how to play. And I'm also not just going to change if they change from game to game. But 
you know, this year, obviously, we started in 4-2-2-2, like the first team, and like the first team, when they rotated into uh, more of a 4-2-3-1, uh, we also made that change. Uh, you know, when a significant change is made like that, then I usually try to follow it. It's got to be a challenge for you. I mean, sometimes you have three, four, five guys in your starting 11 who didn't practice with the U.S. health team all week or for weeks or for months. You've got to blend them in style-wise, get results, get them ready for the Netherlands. It's a lot of juggling that has to be done in your job that I'm not sure fans of this team appreciate. Yeah, part of, uh, part of how I deal with that is, is to be around the first team uh, on a consistent basis and as much as possible so that when the players come back and forth, that the message and, and the style uh, and the tactics are... You know, maybe not 100% aligned, but at least, you know, that 90, I don't even know how to judge it percentage-wise, but it, but I know that, you know, I'm going to play as close as possible away so that when guys go back and forth, that even though the personnel may change, that there's still some kind of consistency there that they can fall back on and, and feel comfortable uh, in, in that way. Last year, you had a team that won the USL Championship regular season and then lifting the trophy at the end of the year. It was really an exciting season for the team. What is the balance between winning games, winning championships, but also getting those two, three, four guys ready to take that jump to the next step? Yeah, I mean, my focus is always those two, three, four guys to, to make the next step. I, I, you know, it's my approach is that you don't always know who those guys are. You have some ideas of who you like or, or who's doing well or who you see in the future making this step. But at the same time, you never know who's going to turn the page and, and start to develop really quickly. And so I, I try to make sure, one, that the environment's very good, two, that there's consistency with the first team, and then, you know, hopefully uh, invest in indiv individuals, uh, each individual on the team, so that, um, you know, depending on how things progress and how things move, that I'm, I'm investing in, in each player so that when they do start to develop, I, I can give them those little extra tips or whatever to, to make sure that they're making that next step to the first team. So uh, hopefully winning is a consequence of that and not uh, uh, the driver of, of what we do. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you, you can't go losing every game. You, you have, these guys... Results are win. important. Results are important, for sure. They're not the most important thing, but they are important. So striking that balance is not easy. Uh, I'm still learning. I, I don't know what the perfect balance is, but I feel like uh, as long as I continue to... Uh, work on improving each individual and at the same time having a good environment, um, then development will happen and winning will be a consequence. And, you know, at the same time, learning how to win is part of development. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to shy away from uh, talking about winning. I'm not going to shy away from um, talking about losing. Um, you know, I, I may not put a, an emphasis on it, but it, but it's going to be in there somehow in the mix, making sure that guys know that winning is, is, is part of uh, the whole process. You have a head, a head coach in Jesse Marsh who's all about goals, right? And, he, you know, he's an analytics guy and everything else. Does he have a goal for you to get so many guys developed and up into the first team every year? Is that something that's kind of laid out for you as a, a broad? It, it's a really tricky thing, and... Uh, you know, that's a little bit more with, with Dennis. Uh, Maybe you should get one and, and you know, get, get a bonus involved. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've kind of shied away from that just because I know how, how tricky it can be and, and how uh, hard it is to predict. Uh, you know, I, I know for myself I'm, I'm motivated to, to get as many players as possible to that first team. I'm, I'm not going to just focus on one guy. I'm not going to focus on two guys. I'm going to focus on the team uh, and each individual. Um, you know, it's going to be dictated by how guys are as professionals and how they come in and how they drive, push themselves and drive forward. But uh, I'm going to commit to each guy to make sure that I'm, I'm helping each person get better because I know also in the collective, if each guy gets a little bit better, that's going to help the top guys as well. So um, I'm not a big person on setting, I'm, I'm a math major, but I'm not a big person on setting goals and, and uh, specific, more, well, Goals, obviously, you still have, but specific numbers, that's not going to be uh, what we do. But at the same time, uh, I'm motiv motivated to, to make sure that uh, I'm pushing as many forward as possible. Dennis might need a math major with targeted allocation money, general allocation money, because <laughs> a native player. You know, do you ever go in there, just kind of, you know, beautiful mind, go onto his whiteboard and just start messing around with the numbers? No, because I don't know the rules well enough. So <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of You tell of me rules. the rules and, and give me the numbers, I think I could do a pretty good job, but, uh, you know. Every time I get an education on what the rules are, by it changes. The next time we have a conversation, the rules have changed. <laughs> so, 
uh, it's it's certainly a, a, a tricky thing and it's not easy and uh, you know it makes it really hard to plan and to you know have a, um, a plan for the club that that is forward-looking you know because the, the rules do change and the numbers change and whatever so you, you know you still try and do the best you can and, and make good decisions and you know here we work pretty collectively so uh, you know I'm, we're all involved on, on little levels uh, with all the decisions that are made with players and that stuff. But, man, it is a tough job, that's for sure. You, t you talk about the top guys, and I think fans know a lot of the names of Valoa, Bezacourt, Junior Flemings, uh, Hassan, Hassan Nadam, some of those names. Is there a guy this year that you kind of, you know, maybe was a little bit under the radar, but has stepped up and you see the development and, and you see some of the growth and, you know, not to burden him, but you just say, well, he's really taken a step forward this year, you know, from, from your core group of guys? Yeah, I mean, I... I the first person that comes to mind is Ben Mines. I think uh, he's been an academy yeah. kid uh, who's going to be with us next year as well. He's still only a junior in high school, so uh, I know people. I don't want to put too much pressure on him or anything like that, but at the same time, he's, he's doing great. And, and Jesse uh, loves him. It's he's exciting. A, he's Princeton bound, right? Isn't he? Or? Uh, I think he's going to Stanford. Oh, okay. So maybe Jesse's a little upset. He might take that personal, but uh, <laughs> no uh, contract for you. Yeah, our academy guys do well with that. Kevin Kevin O'Toole's. Princeton bound. Maybe that's what I was Yeah, and, and he's doing well too. These uh, academy guys are exciting. And, and listen, I don't think they're going to sign professional contracts in the next few months. So you're not going to see him with the first team for a while. But, but you know, I, I think uh, the way these, these guys as uh, teenagers have handled themselves and, and put themselves into professional games in a good way uh, has, has been really impressive. So. Minds is fearless out there. Yeah, that's a great word for it. I mean, he reminds me of Tyler in, in certain ways with that, you know, just doesn't care, is out there, is going to run, work, um, press, run in front of goal. He looks for his chances. He's not always perfect, but, um, you know, that kind of mentality is is great. Uh, it's necessary for to be a professional, to be a successful professional, but it's really important in the way we play to be out there and be brave and, and courageous in, in the way you go about things, whether it's against the ball or with the ball. And one of the guys who... I was impressed with, and I had the opportunity to call Sunday's match uh, with Jonathan Yardley, and, you know, Hassan Nadam goes out there and makes a mistake, a bad back pass, le leads to a goal from Charleston, and then he seems to bounce back and just, you know, he has a short-term memory, which is a good thing as a defender because you're going to make mistakes. You know that as a forward, and, and some defenders, you know, get rattled from it. He just seemed to just kind of bounce back and just play his game. Yeah, he's a young guy, and, and that's a tough to position to play as a young guy because you need experience, you need to see plays coming, and... Uh, you know, I, I think he's gonna ha he's certainly gonna have his struggles, and there's gonna be moments where uh, you're you're gonna wonder, you know, is, is this is, does he have enough? But I think we all believe here that um, you know he's gonna continue to improve, and I think we've already seen that. And uh, you know, he he has done a good job of moving on from mistakes, but at the same time, he can t continue to get better at that. And uh, you know, you see. You see a lot of good things from him. He's a big athletic guy, but it's also his soccer is very good. Sometimes, at times, he's he's one of our best passers out of the back, uh, which uh, I think is a a great asset to have. Sometimes that's one of the harder things to, to help center backs with going forward. Um, and listen, we, we challenge him. We challenge him greatly, but he, he's a good professional. He loves to come in early. He works hard um, and uh, does a really good job. You know, we've talked about the here and now, but let's go back to 1998. Uh, a, a young, fresh-looking John Wallenex drafted first round, I think number seven pick overall, uh, before there was even an MLS Super Draft. You were taken, you didn't make that first team, and I think you went on to play for maybe the Staten Island Vipers. Uh, I, I don't remember, or was it the Rough, Rough Riders? Riders? Rough yeah. Riders. Did, did you think your MLS shot was was gone? Um, That's got to be tough, straight out of college, question. high draft pick. Yeah, it it was it, it was tough in a lot of ways. Uh, one, I got released on uh, April Fools, so that was kind of a cruel joke. Uh, two, I didn't get to talk to the head coach. That was weird. Um, they also did it in the afternoon when I would, had gone home from training already. And from what I heard, I think they took a fine for entering the the roster, the final roster, late. Um, so maybe it was a tough decision for him or whatever. But. Uh, yeah, it wasn't easy. I think they kept the other three draft picks and, and released me as the first round pick. So that and was And you had the longest career, I think, out of all of the uh, all the draft picks. Um, yeah, that's possible. I, I, I know those those guys. They were good guys. They're good players. Eric Cavello and Kevin Knight. I remember them uh, pretty well. And those guys went on to play. But um, you know, I was fortunate. I 
I think, you know, to the base of your question that I think it was over. No, I felt, you know, I, it was kind of a coming from a smaller school and not getting much attention, especially getting draft, uh, sorry, recruited into college. Uh, you know, I wasn't coming from a place where I thought I was, you know, that, that my path was, you know, into professional soccer. So, um, you know, to get drafted was exciting and somewhat came out of nowhere. And, uh, you know, I, I just wasn't prepared to, to be a pro at the time. Um, and as hard as it was uh, to get cut, uh, I was still motivated and I, I ended up in, a, I think in some ways it was beneficial for me. I think I ended up in a great place. And you started starting, got a lot of minutes. Got a lot of minutes, goals. got to play games, got to play professional games. With, and the Rough Riders were a good team at the time and a lot of good professionals on that team. And, they had just and, won the championship a few years before. In they the had old a great USI history zone. and, um, you know, it was a great place to play. It was still a local team, so I got to um, feel comfortable and be around family and friends while I, you know, started my professional career. and. Uh, Paul Riley was a great coach and really invested me, in me and uh, you know he had some of the answers to what I needed to add to my game at the time uh, and it was you know it went on for the next couple of years to be difficult at times as well and some trades and some other uh, instances of getting fired but uh, I think all those uh, trials and tribulations led me to one understand how much I really wanted to do it and, and that desire was what drove me forward and pushed me to work hard every day and uh, put me in a place where I, as a professional, I really valued coming in every day and trying to get better, whatever that meant. Training hard, lifting, running, uh, all those things. I took all those things pretty seriously, uh, especially as I started to grow. And, and now I feel like all that experience really sets me up uh, to be successful where I am right now. And there's the Bob Bradley connection too. I mean, with, with Jesse and so many of the guys on the staff and this team, you played for Bob as well. E even as a player, were you starting to take things knowing you wanted to get into coaching and, and what impact ha has he had? I mean, he's almost, you know, in the NFL, they talk about the Bill Belichick family, right? You know, and, and the uh, Bill Parcells family. Bradley's now starting to have so many of his guys at the MLS level, assistant national team coaches, et cetera. Yeah, Bob had a huge influence on my career. And if it wasn't for Bob, I'm not sure uh, I would have lasted uh, as a pro, uh, you know, in 2000, um, after my year with the Rough Riders, he, he brought me into Chicago and I got to play there for a year and a half. Uh, and then in 2003, when he became the Metro Stars coach, he brought me in as well. So he gave me two chances at the MLS level. And um, I think, you know, that opportunity uh, is what, you know, added to my resume and it allowed me to, to stay in MLS for, for a number of years. So, And he also got you your first caps with the national team too, I believe, correct? Was that Bob? Actually, that was under Bruce, but that I'm sure Bob Bruce. had something to do with it because at the time I, I was playing with the Metro Stars and playing for Bob and, um, you know, I know those 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 guys obviously had worked together and are, you know, um, had, had, I'm sure had a, a, a relationship in, in that Bruce was the national team coach and Bob was coaching in the league. Um, so uh, I'm sure... Bob has had influence in that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I played for a lot of good coaches, including Bob and Bruce and um, Ziggy and uh, a bunch of these guys. And, and Bob definitely stands out among that group. He's, you know, you always knew uh, that he was a hard worker. Uh, you know, there weren't too many times when I was at, at, the, at the facility where Bob wasn't there, uh, even though I stayed late at times and uh, showed up early. Bob was always there, always working, always watching video, always uh, trying to have little conversations with guys and to show little things and how to get better. And there's, you know, when you think, I heard a comment the other day that, you know, when you, when you really think about it, you know, what do you remember a coach telling you? And when you think about that, it, it it's, uh, it's hard. It's hard to remember exactly what coaches said to you or what you remember. And, and there's only always like one or two or a few things that stand out. And, you know, that I would say, you know, two of the few things that I remember were, were what Bob said to me. So, uh, I think that's a huge compliment to him uh, and, and the influence that he's had on me. All right, let's go back to 2003. One of the greatest crimes in MLS award history. You did not get that goal of the year. Take us through that moment now. Amado Guevara, long pass into the box. What were you looking, what were you trying to do, and did the ball go where you thought it was going to go? <laughs> I always get that question. Um, yeah, so it, first of all, it was, a, it was a really interesting day. Uh, I was supposed to start, and uh, one of <laughs> Is that Bob is the coach, and, and when I arrived at the the uh, the locker room, Bob grabbed me, pulled me inside, and actually said that I wasn't uh, wasn't going to start. So it was one of those few times that uh, I had told my family and friends and everything that I was going to start, and 
um, you know, Baba changed his mind. Um, so, you know, happens, professional game. Uh, so anyway, I spent 90 minutes on the bench. Uh, game goes into overtime. Uh, Clint Mathis, I think, pulled himself off with a little bit of an injury. So I ended up going into overtime. At the time, they played two five-minute halves, which is weird thinking about it now. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I still remember the ball that I got from that game because when I scored, they gave me the ball afterwards and it was uh, has written on the 99th minute. You don't see that very often. But um, it was the last minute of the game. Um, I believe it was my only touch of the game. Uh, I think I might have flicked the header on, but only better, touch with your feet. Better story if I just say it was my only touch. Um, and so you get that long ball, right? You see the ball. You start running down that channel. I think it was down the left side. Yeah. So there was a foul at midfield on the right side of the field. Amato Gravari gets on the ball, and uh, you know Amato and I had a, had a great relationship. And I think that was one of the plays that kind of started to build that relationship um, because that was the first year I played with him. And the next year, uh, you know, I had scored. 10 goals and I think it was you know the roots of that kind of started from from this play and I just figured last play of the game Amato's going to hit a good ball into the box and I'm just going to run and get on the end of it uh never thinking that it would you know end up where it did or be a volley I was thinking more you know get in front of goal and nodding it on um but the ball was just he played a perfect ball he put it into a spot behind their back line and in front of their goalkeeper where I could get to it uh and and basically in full stride I just ran onto it and hit it as hard as I could I don't think I planned on it uh, going exactly where it went. Um, I just figured I was close enough to goal that if I made good contact and, and tried to hit it back across the goal that, that I would be, be all right. Um, so it worked out. <laughs> what goes through your mind that moment when you see the ball hit the back of the net? Yeah, it went crazy. I, th I think you kind of twirled around a couple yeah, of times. Yeah, it went really crazy because obviously it was exciting last minute. Uh, and at that time it was golden goal, so the game was over. Right. And uh, I knew we had won. And you know, obviously that's that's the most important thing. And uh, at first, you know, normally you score on the left side of the, side of the goal and you just run off to the, the, to the left uh, corner flag. Um, and, you know, in mid-celebration mode, I had remembered that my, my friends had come. I had, uh, a buddy of mine had put together a, a group of about 40 guys that had come to the game and they were chanting my name. Wally's Wall. Army. Yeah, I guess you can call it that. I don't think we did officially at the time. Uh, but I figured, all right, I got to run over to them because they supported me all game even though I wasn't playing, so... Uh, decided to little little change up and, and went to the other side of the field uh, to celebrate in front of my friends. But uh, yeah, it was an exciting moment. Is that one of the moments that you take away from the MLS career? You know, all those moments that may be one of the most, uh, I mean, people were buzzing about that goal for weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's one of two things that, pe well, three things that people ask me about in my career, it's amazing that that's what are the other two? Three. What are the other two things? Uh, the other was the MLS I'm Cup. Okay. No, it, well, yes, but like if if you're talking specifically like moments in my career, it was, it was that goal against Columbus, the MLS uh, Cup goal, MLS in Cup goal also against Columbus, and then the yeah, you just uh, hate the color yellow. The unfortunate Thriller dance is is the other. <laughs> it surprises me that those are the things. It surprises me that that was that goal was in 2003, and that it's. 14 years later, that's unbelievable. Uh, that, that was a special moment, though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The thriller moment was pretty special. Too. And that was kind of the comeback of the franchise a little bit, too, because they'd gone through some dips in 2001, 2002, missing the playoffs. And then Bob comes on board 2003. A lot of young guys, you know, on that team. And Yeah, it was an exciting year. I mean, um, you know, Tim Howard was at the team, and then he left to go to, to Man United. And, um, yeah, in August. You know, in, the in the summer, we were in first place and then kind of trailed off at the end. And... Um, you know, kind of, we had a good year and we were a good team and had some high expectations and things didn't work out in the playoffs, obviously, but um, it was, we, had to, we were in the Open Cup final that year as well. Um, another Lost unfortunate to moment, yeah. losing to, to Jesse and Chris at home. Uh, and Dennis as well as part of the staff. Damani uh, Rolf, who's basically a part of the staff. Yeah, Damani, <laughs> Damani got me twice that year because he won that Open Cup and he also won the, the goal of the year that year. So, uh, you know, it's, it's funny seeing him around the facility nowadays because... Um, so you're saying Junior Flemings may not start this week. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't hold it that personal. Uh, but we'll see. And you've, <laughs> you've seen the ups and downs of this of this team, you know, practicing at Kane University, sometimes having to go to, I think, a public park in East Rutherford under Bob once in a while. You guys didn't know where you were going to be. Giant stadium days, you know, playing the Open Cup at Rutgers. I mean, there's a lot of... A lot of development and changes that, you know, now you play at a beautiful facility at Montclair State University. There's Red Bull Arena. There's this training facility. Probably things you didn't imagine five years ago, let <laughs> alone 10 or 1998. Yeah, it's been an amazing change because I played 
in the you know essentially been around the, the league when I was playing for 12 years and the change from the first year to the to the 12th was was pretty big but most of that happened right at the end and then obviously from the time when I stopped playing till now a lot has happened so you know from uh, you know showing up at Keen uh, and training with uh, Tony Miola and, and uh, Alexi Lalas and them call not remembering my name and just calling me Fordham till <laughs> you know Alexi would never do that <laughs> Still, uh, you know, playing on the island out in the parking lot at Giant Stadium when they removed the, the grass tiles from from the uh, field to, like you said, taking vans to um, different high school fields, different turf fields, to playing at Montclair, waiting for a gym class to get out so we can get on the field. There was uh, a charm to that, though. <laughs> a charm is a good word for it, yeah. Till now where we have this great facility and coaches have offices and the players have big lockers and... Uh, they have food after training. Uh, it's a big change, and I try not. You've to got your well. You don't have your own office. You, I you don't share. have my own office, but it's we a can nice get a cubicle player. wall though with Ebra though, maybe just to give you Do a little privacy. Cubicles. No, we we're big uh, group workers here, so we try and keep a uh, open. Uh, Vadim over there, the goalkeeper coach. Okay. He's a chatterbox though, so you may want the wall <laughs> there. My staff is. It's funny during the week they're very quiet. They don't say much. Obviously, talk a lot about the game and opponents and players. Um, but it is like the U- it is like the UN in here time, though. You've got, we're, we're you've got the Russian Vadim. You've got the Ugandan representative with Ibra. Yeah. It, it is it is it is a, an interesting dynamic of group thought though that each one brings. You bring some of the MLS experience, Ibra. The you know his experience in South America. Your Vadim as well playing you know Champions League clubs and a lot yeah, of experience in this room. It's a great mix. It's a diverse environment, and uh, you know I think that uh, adds a lot. I think that adds to you know, how we, we interact with each other. It, it adds to how we interact with the players. The players are very diverse. It's a good good idea to have a diverse staff so that, you know, you can get some common understanding there, and uh, it works pretty well. So as we close out, you're a Jersey guy now, officially, right? I mean, I know you lived in central Jersey. Now you've moved up to the <laughs> Mars County area. You, you've, you've got a wife. You've, you've got a kid. You know, you're getting old, John. You're not that I fresh-faced know. 98, you're, you know, 1998 draft pick anymore. No, that is true. Um it's been a long run, and I am getting old. Uh, but I tell you what, like working here and working in this game, you know, keeps you feeling young. And uh, you know, when you <laughs> when you think about it, and you think that you you've turned forty, I've turned forty this year. It, it's uh, obviously that's a difficult thing for anybody to handle. But you know, it, it it it's surprising to me because I don't feel like that. So um, I think a lot of that comes from when, when you enjoy what you do. So I'm, I'm lucky in that way. Jesse said when he gets stressed, he goes home and he landscapes. He mows the lawn. He <laughs> what, what's, you know, final question, what, what does John Wallenek do when he, you know, maybe there's a tough day at work or a bad loss or something like that? How do you vent? Are you um, a house project guy? You go up and clean the gutters? I or? am not a house project guy. Uh, I've gotten into my, my lawn a little bit, so I don't mean to say the same thing as Jesse, but I cer- I don't get into landscaping. We have people luckily cut the grass and, and that whole thing. But uh, So you're into I've your lawn. So, so, so how are you into the lawn if you have people cut the grass? Do you sit out there in a lifeguard chair and just, you know, oh, no. you missed a blade or? <laughs> well, my neighbors make fun of me because I'm out there on my knee- hands and knees pulling weeds and stuff because it's it's that bad. Um, but, you know, just, it's, it's been a, I don't know what I'm doing. So that's part of the problem. I you can get obsessive about the lawn to, though. It, it has become a little bit of an, an obsession. So uh, listen, I've got the greenest lawn My wife's answer would be that so. I lay on the couch, but I think the biggest thing is, you know, my daughter's, uh, you know, I certainly don't vent around her, but it, it, it makes it an easy uh, way to, to get away from stuff. When, it's a when positive you, release. It's a positive change of mind for sure. Um, that, and, and it makes it easy. So. Well, John, a lot of years with the club, and thanks for taking us down a trip down memory lane. No problem. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Memory lane and the future with the USL. That's true. John Wallenack, head coach of New York Red Bulls 2. An absolutely great sit-down conversation there with John Wallenack, who has seen so much in the development of soccer in this country, and in particular here in the New York area. Someone who grew up playing in Staten Island, his college soccer in Fordham, and then you know being able to move on and be cut from the Metro Stars as a first round pick, find his footing then with the Long Island Rough Riders, and then moving forward with the Chicago Fire and throughout MLS, 
eventually ending his career in t retiring as a New York Red Bull in 2010. I mean, someone who's now transitioned from the playing field to being such an important part of this organization. And look, the success of many of the players this year, Tyler Adams, the su success he's having at the under 20 World Cup and with the national team right now, this is gonna be a future national team player in regular in the starting 11. Uh, John Wallenek oversaw his development. Sean Davis, who I thought put together a very solid start this past weekend against the Revolution, came up and, and played his USL ball under John Wallenek. We're seeing Derek Etienne, other pieces, Aaron Long, who, who starred with the USL team, now a starting center back for the Red Bulls at the MLS level. Again, more products of the development of John Wallenek, who I don't think gets enough credit, uh, not only in the Red Bulls organization, or, or at least from the fan base, but also within US soccer for what he's doing when you look at the number of academy players and prospects that he's had with the USL over the past couple of years. And we talked about Kevin O'Toole. We talked about uh, Ben Mines, who I think has tremendous potential at the MLS level, uh, you know, being guys who are growing, learning, developing, and nurturing under John Wallenek. And, uh, you know, I'm blessed. I have the opportunity to watch Jesse Marsh and, and the coaching staff on a regular basis at the training facility. Uh, you know, you really get up close and, and get to see the coaching styles. And, and Wallenek, to me, with the USL, when I watch those sessions, he brings such a level-headed perspective that's needed when you're dealing with young players in, in their late teens. So, you know, some of them don't even, can't even drive to the facility. They get dropped off by their parents and then players in their early 20s who are still learning and growing in the game. And, and Wally is so level-headed, uh, doesn't really overreact to the mistakes. And, and perhaps a more seasoned coach would not bring that perspective. But John Wallenek, to me, does such a good job of, of understanding it's a learning process. And, and I go back to this past Sunday, and we referenced it in the podcast. Hassan Nadam has a rather poor back pass, uh, leads to a goal, and, and Charleston looks like that they're back in the game, might even take away three points from, from Montclair State University soccer park and, and the Red Bulls too. Wallenek doesn't overreact, just kind of stands there, applauds, you know, gives a word or two of encouragement to Nadam, who then goes out and finishes out the, the second half of that match so strong, uh, winning his duels, playing controlled, playing smart. And when you're talking about a young player like Nadam, 18 years old, first full season or first season period playing professional soccer, it's tough to go up against some of these players. And I and I think Nadam uh, just being able to, to get that uh, the experience, and but also learning how to handle mistakes. Uh, someone who brings the calm composure of a John Wallenek is, is perfect for this job with the organization. And so influential in the development of many players in MLS, but now also we're seeing on the international level. So that was a lot of fun with John Wallenek, uh, you know, guy now out here, Jersey guy, you know I love my Jersey guys. Uh, li living it up, living the dream with the New York Red Bulls too, and very much deserving of being USL Coach of the Year last season. So that's going to put a wrap on, on this episode of the Red Bulls Insider Podcast. I'm Christian Dyer, and looking forward to bringing you another one next week.